So we're going to get started. Today is a pretty interesting topic, and it's something that uh, a lot of attorneys don't think about, but traditionally is, is something that attorneys have thought about when they went to law school and also when they come out of law school. And that's the idea that your law degree is a business license. And a lot of times attorneys don't necessarily think of that. Depending on where you went to law school or what your future you think looks like, it's always very important to think about running a, a business as an attorney and whether or not that's in a law firm or you're running it on your own. Because the more you think about the fact that you're really running a business, the better off you're actually going to be in the practice of law. And unfortunately, lots of attorneys do not think of their careers that way. And because of that, they, they many times are dependent on other people. And there's a whole psychology that I'm going to cover today, which is the difference between thinking like an employee inside of a law firm or thinking like the law firm is actually a business that works for you if you work in a law firm. Or you can always go out on your own and start a business as an attorney. Much of what I'm saying goes against what, what people traditionally think of when they think of the legal profession. And the law is a profession, but the problem is you can you know quickly find yourself in a, in a dead-end job. You can find yourself unemployed. Your skills and specialty can often become very irrelevant in the marketplace quickly. And you can also often find yourself in geographic locations where there is no work. And this kind of thing is something that I see on a daily basis. I see in my profession and in this profession that I do, I see attorneys all the time that are in locations where they can't get jobs. I see people where they're not advancing. I see people with skills that are no longer relevant. And the problem is that no one really seems to think that take the time to really think about their careers as businesses. And and, and that's really the, the most important way for you to think. If you're a good businessman, your career can go very far. If you ignore business realities in terms of the way that your business works, uh, you can get into a lot of trouble. And I see attorneys go out of business all the time. I see them sometimes go out of business uh, right when their careers start. I see other attorneys go out of business 10 years in or 15 years in. And your objective as a business person always needs to be to stay in the business and to always have work and, and stuff to do and hopefully have a growing business. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to examine today and talk about four, four different things or three different things. The first is that your career needs to have a marketable product. And I'm going to talk about how to do that. I'm going to look at your brand and in terms of how to market your brand and how to have a brand in the, um, and, uh, in the legal market. And then I'm also going to talk to you about how to explore and how to market your product to be successful. And what I do a lot of times in my job is I'm, when we do resume workshops and so forth, I'm trying to help people create a marketable product. And then when I do a lot of writing on my personal blog, which is HarrisonBarnes.com, which kind of talks about how to come up with a personal brand that you can use. And then, and then I also, what we do at BCG and the Law Crossing and different companies is we talk about how to market your product, meaning how to to find the most firms and places to apply to and the most in-house places. And, and so this is for attorneys, obviously, but it, it applies to pretty much anybody if you think about it. The first thing is that your career needs a marketable product. And that's obviously quite obvious, but the problem is, is that your the, the product qualities, <clears throat> what goes into making your product will initially determine how much you can sell your product for and where. A business will sell all sorts of things. And your business as an attorney is going to be selling yourself. But shortly in your career, when your career starts, you'll start having a brand and, and there'll be particular attributes and so forth that characterize your brand. And those attributes are going to be uh, pretty obvious. Uh, the, becoming an attorney, for the most part, is something that starts when many people are in college and or even before they go to college, depending on the college they go to. So the quality of the university you go to, obviously, it has uh, some impact on the type of law firm you get into. And it has an impact on the law school you attend. And, and that can have something to do with it. And then when you go to law school, these are how well you perform in law school is another thing. And that's important. And the qualities you, you get for your brand while you're in law school, if you're on a journal and you're doing well, are all going to be products, product qualities. And, and then you're obviously investing money in your product by the cost of the school and, and how hard you work and what you give up in the short term to do well in school. And these things are all going to determine how much you can charge. The people that, you know, and I hate to say this, but the people that do go to the, the best schools and do the best there have the ability to charge the most for their product and do so in the largest market. So they can go into, you know, the most competitive markets and, and they can do well. And if you don't go to, if your product is not from, from, the, from the best schools all the time, it's not as easy to do. You have to do very well. And then the next step, you have to, to make your product marketable. You have to take the bar exam. 
And in, even in California and New York, there's lots of people that have very good grades and stuff in law school. And for whatever reason, it takes them a while to pass the bar exam because they don't study or whatever as much as they should. So you're basically, the, the way to think about it is when you choose to go to law school, you've made a lot of decisions and those decisions are going to lead you essentially to have a business. And you're going to sell the product of that business to a law firm, corporation, or government, or someone else. And, but you're running a business and you have to decide what that business stands for and what it means. And, and your early brand is going to be your college and law school and where you summered and so forth. And, and some uh, people, when they come out of law school, have very hot brands, meaning there may be a lot of very desirable things about you, or they may not. So it doesn't really matter. Your brand will certainly evolve throughout its career, your career, but your brand is going to have some early product qualities that are important. And then to stay in business, uh, you always have to have a marketable product. What that means is uh, you're going to have lots of decisions along the way about how to operate your business. You're, and every decision you make, uh, every decision a business makes is going to determine the marketability of its products. If someone decides to change the formula to Coke, that's going to have a, an effect on the, the marketability of their product. Or if somebody decides to not invest in uh, a new model year for a car that's going to have a, an impact. So every decision you make is going to determine how marketable uh, you are. And, and there's so many choices. When you come out of school, you have to decide, and all throughout your career, you have to decide, do you want to be a big firm lawyer? Do you want to be a solo lawyer? Do you want to be a government attorney or an in-house attorney? You have to make all these decisions. And, and those are very important. And so you're always in charge of your legal career, but the decisions you make, and you have to remember that each of them is going to go into how marketable your product is in the future, and which is important. The better decisions you make, the more marketable you're going to be in the future. And, and there's certain aspects uh, of your product that are never going to change. You're never going to be able to change a lot of things you've done in the past. Your law school, by the way, for those of you that are young, fades into almost very little importance in the long run, but the you know, same things as the first firms you worked at and all sorts of things, but, but you just need to understand that those are product qualities. And, and the, the most important thing for any business is you know, how well that business is operating. And the business can certainly operate all sorts of different ways, but the most important thing is how well the business is operating. The legal field is very much like the business world. All businesses need marketable products. And so if you're doing personal injury law at your own solo law firm, that's your product. Uh, you'll be able to sell that in certain areas to certain size audiences and not others. But everything is about having a marketable product throughout your career. So you need to have something that's marketable. And, and the point of any business, of course, is to survive and for many businesses to grow. You know, what a lot of people don't really think about this, I don't think. They think that they can make all sorts of decisions and those decisions may not necessarily penalize them. But you have to really think in terms of every decision you make is going to have a long-term impact on the business. So if you go in one direction, that's going to have an impact of your ability to sell yourself in other, in other ways in the future. One of the most important aspects is of the business is the type of work you do. And if you do tax law, for example, you're going to, that's you know, an, an issue. If you're, regardless of the, the practice area you're in, it's important to understand uh, that those decisions that you make have more appeal uh, to the market than others. But you just want to make the best business decisions. You need to think in terms of every decision that you make. Is that the right decision? And one of the ways that people do that, of course, is by the practice areas they choose. Certain practice areas are more marketable than others. Railroad law, for example, used to be very popular. Different geographic areas, a lot can happen to you based on uh, the geographic area you choose. Some people may choose to work in a uh, you know, smaller market where there is a lot of work in their practice area. Other people may want to be in, in a larger market. So all of those things are going to have kind of a major bearing on your whether or not you succeed. And then the next one, of course, is the importance of your brand uh, to marketing your product. The type of attorney you are, you know, that it really has a lot to do with your brand. And, and, and so that's really a lot of what uh, I write about is, is your brand and how you do things on the market. And, and the brand that I talk about is how attorneys can be marketable to large and small law firms, but mainly large law firms. And, and you need to have a good brand. Your own, if you're operating your own law firm, the quality of your brand is going to determine the number of clients you get on the type of clients you get, if you're practicing a large law firm, the quality of your work, your interpersonal relationships, and whether or not you're ultimately bringing in business. And the point of all this is that most brands have certain attributes and over time, you're going to have a specific brand as well.
And and if you think about how companies operate, companies spend a lot of time and money developing their brands. When you think of uh, BMW or Chevy, like you have a thought about what the Chevy brand means. You think you have thoughts about compared to BMW or the same thing with RC Cola compared to Coke. And and you're developing a brand with every decision you make and where you work, your practice area and all this is going to have a lot to do uh, with your brand. And most brands can charge more and, and they're going to have a lot more interest. The better the brand, the more they can charge. And every decision that you make in terms of the places you choose to work, the type of work you choose to do, the, the schools you go to, the how long you stay at an employer, what everything you do are going to really come across and, and be what your brand ultimately is. And, and you need to think very carefully about what type of brand you want to have. The final thing I'm going to talk about today before taking questions is how to market your brand and product for the maximum success. You need to think in terms of what's happening. So if your salary is $100,000 a year in a firm, then just say in this, obviously your billing rate is probably higher than this, but if you were billing $200 an hour and you're expected to bill 2,000 hours a year, this means that your small business is generating $400,000 a year and you're netting $100,000, which Actually, from a business standpoint, isn't that bad. And the reason is because most businesses do not clear 25% of the money that they generate. So that's actually not that bad. And I'm surprised that most attorneys are most interested in going. I am surprised, I'm sorry, that most law, attorneys are interested in going to the law firms that have the most prestige associated with them because these are all uh, business decisions. And, and, and so you want the, you know, the amount of money that you collect from your billings to increase. So most people are trying to earn more and more money. Uh, consistently. And that's just how the process works. But if you're going to make more money at a better firm with a better brand that can bill you out at more money than you would at a brand that's not as good. And so the law firms with the best brands are typically going to give you a better brand. And so everything that happens is a result of the amount of money that you can charge for your services is ultimately responsible, is going to be influenced by your brand. And, and lots of attorneys, for example, do not go to the best law schools. Or they, many of them start out in uh, horrible law firms. As, as a matter of fact, the majority of attorneys do not go to the best law schools. The majority of attorneys don't start out in the best law firms. But out of that group of people, many of them become an extremely, extremely successful. And I see it all the time. And, and the reason that happens is because those attorneys become experts in marketing their brand. And I've seen so many examples of this. I am friends with several attorneys that have done this, and it's pretty remarkable. And you can do this in almost any practice area you want. And you don't have to go to the best schools. You don't have to have the best work in the best firms. You don't even need to work in a firm at all if you understand that it's all about how you position yourself. And the most important thing that an attorney can do is really understand the rules of marketing. And if it was me and I was practicing law right now, I would be uh, reading books about marketing and so forth pretty much all the time. I would want to do everything I could to understand marketing because I would want to position myself in the most effective way. I would want to learn how do I look like the best product? How do I stand out from the crowd? How do I not become a commodity that gets pushed down by the market? How do I do all these things? And so becoming a student of marketing is a hugely important thing. And honestly, most of the success, most successful attorneys out there have become students of marketing and they've learned about marketing and they, they become very enthusiastic about marketing. And you should too. Marketing, if you understand marketing and you understand that, then you, you'll be able to really put together a good brand and, and you should be studying marketing all the time. And you should read you know several books a year if you're an attorney because your brand will d influence how you're seen inside of your law firm. It'll influence how you're seen if you start your own practice. It'll influence um, the decisions you make. And so here are just a, a couple of, here's a couple of points. So the first thing is when you market anything, you need to appeal to people on a rational level, meaning that the cost makes sense, but you also need to appeal to them on an emotional level. And, and with personal services, personal services are very important because people, they trust what you're going to do and they don't have any real yardstick to, to measure the quality of what you're offering. So they just have to trust in the fact that you may offer a good service. And most law firms will prefer to hire a certain type of person and that has a similar background. And, and so your product actually may be a very good product in some areas of the country and others in some types of firms and not others. And that's fine. But one of the things that I noticed was I was, I spent about a year, not a year, but almost a year trying to write a book about personal injury attorneys. And I noticed that the the personal injury attorneys typically never had, and the, they were very successful, but they typically didn't have a lot of big firm experience or the best law firm credentials, but they were just extremely uh, good at marketing themselves in terms of the way they 
uh, position themselves in terms of the way that the type of arguments they were able to make to, for people to use them, the the way that they talked about their victories and so forth. And so that's a very powerful thing is to be able to market yourself. And very few people do that. And and a lot of very good personal injury attorneys also, they're just very flamboyant. And, and and where you market yourself is important. So in small towns, there's lots of very successful attorneys and that may have grown up in the area and are very much like the people they're working for. And, and what's very su- interesting is even in, in small towns, the most successful ones are the ones that are doing the most marketing. They're going to the local clubs and bar associations. So they're, they're many times they have billboards on the road and they're, and people talk about them. And this is just all marketing. You can really, if you know how to do marketing, you can really run a big firm. Some of the, I know one attorney that, that runs a firm that I, she does over $25 million a year in revenue. And it's in just a niche practice area. She never worked in a law firm and, and is all self-taught. And, but it's all about marketing and she spends all of her time marketing and hardly other people do the, the practice of law and she's become very successful and well-known in her specialty. Lots of people, if they understand marketing, can do very well. And it's the same thing in big cities. In big cities, you may try to get clients to come to your firm and so forth. And that's a marketing component and, and how you're positioned and how you look to the clients. And, and the large part of what I do for a living is position attorneys. And so today, if anyone has questions about how to market themselves and position themselves, I'd love to talk about that. It's something you can certainly talk about all day. It's a very kind of interesting topic. And, and, and one of the ways that, that I get people jobs is basically by positioning them in a certain way. And I package them so I know what to say in order to make them look attractive to a certain brand of firm and how to take their experience and, and make it look a certain way. And, and you know, the work we do is not dishonest. And it's just knowing the things to say to a particular firm about someone that firm is buying and making them look like what the customer wants. So this is a short presentation today, but the big point I just want to make to everyone is really to think, and the most important thing you can do in your career is to think about your career as a small business and think about your brand as a small business, think about your product and um, do everything you can to make sure um, there's a market for your product. And those are the most important things. And this is a ongoing topic. There's uh, lots of articles that I've written on BCG about treating your career like a small business and, and other aspects about why a license, getting your, your bar uh, card and stuff is a license to uh, open a business, but it, it really is. And so you need to think like a business person. And that's the mistake that a lot of people make when they go into the legal field is they don't think about things from a business standpoint. And you should have, any, every attorney should have some sort of fundamental, to the extent they can, understanding of economics and understanding of business and understanding of marketing. Because the more you do, the less you're going to be dependent on other people that are making those business decisions for you. So if you go to work in a law firm, other people are making business decisions. And if you're, uh, and so you need to understand where you, you sit and all that stuff. So I will uh, be back in one second. And uh, when I come back, I will answer questions and you guys can ask questions about this or uh, pretty much any legal topic you are, career topic you guys have today. Thanks. Great. Let's start for questions. Give me one second. Okay. Questions are always like my favorite part of the week. So I love getting questions. So let's see here. Second here. Okay. So the first question is, this is pretty quick that came out. It says, as a uh, 2L student, I have an offer from a small law firm in a non-major market and from a large prosecutor's office in a major market. I want to work in the market where the prosecutor is, but I do not want to, but I want to do so in a law firm. What is a better option for my situation? That's a great question. Depending on the quality of the small law firm, I really, you have a couple of different options. So the problem with working in a prosecutor's office is if you work in a prosecutor's office, as you're set in your second summer, people are going to think that you want to be a prosecutor or work for the government. So it's going to be much more difficult for you to get a position in the future with a with, with a law firm when you're trying to get a job as a 3L. Law firms are also going to think that you may not have been able to get a job in a law firm. So there, there's a couple different ways to think about that. If the small law firm is not in a major market, but it's a good law firm where you can see yourself having a future, then I really uh, would probably take the small law firm route if you believe that it could lead to an offer and a career and if they do the type of work you're trying to do. So I don't know what kind of work you're trying to do. I'm assuming it's litigation because you're doing prosecution. 
or it could be, I don't know, but, but I, as a 2L, your, the summer after your second year is very important and it does set the tone. If you work in the prosecutor's office, I would also wonder if that could lead to a job later on. Now, prosecutors can go into law firms later, but typically as criminal defense or white collar defense attorneys. So that's where that's going to lead. The, the big concern that I have in terms of what you're saying is the market that you're interested in. The most important thing for a young attorney is to have access to work. And sorry, to have access to work. You should be more concerned about the, the quality of the work you're getting as a young attorney and um, the type of work than you should be concerned about the market you're working in. It's it honestly, the market you're in when you're a law student and you're choosing what market to work in, most attorneys spend the majority of their days sitting behind a desk in an office building. So that's just kind of how it works. And, and it doesn't really matter where you do that. In many cases, it's nicer to be in a smaller market because you don't have as long of a commute and it's easier to get ahead and it's not as hectic and you can have a bigger place to live and a car and all sorts of things. I believe that access to work and then the second one is working somewhere where there's a future somewhere with the future. So those are the two two things that I would keep in mind. Now, if you have to be uh, in the market where the, you know, where the prosecutor's office is for whatever reason, your family's there or something, then it's certainly okay to take that job. But my option, my ability would, or my instinct would be to take the job in the smaller market. If you want to work in a law firm, just offers a different, a better type of training because you're working for private clients. When you work for the government, the problem with the government is the, the quality of the work can differ. The government often, depending on the department of the government, the state and the federal and different locations, there's different quality of work that's expected and there's different qualities of attorneys. And, and work in a prosecutor's office is not general commercial litigation, it's prosecution. So it's not going to really prepare you to do anything but that. And the final thing is, is a lot of prosecutors do retire and want to do something else fairly early. So prosecution is a great job when you're young, but it can get pretty tiring. And it often does not lead to anything else, meaning it's very difficult to get into anything but criminal defense and so forth once you have that uh, training, because it doesn't teach you certain research skills and stuff. It teaches you how to go to trial and to and do all sorts of things. But if that's not the kind of work you want to be in a law firm, you may be better off. And the, the final thing is I hate to give people so much information here, but this is just a really loaded question and you're at an important decision. So I do want to give you uh, a lot of information, but the benefit of a law firm is a law firm compared to the government, law firm compared to government, is you can work, is that you can work in a law firm, attorneys practice. So if you come out of law school at 25, you can practice and practice till you're in your nineties. I've seen that happen. If you come out of law school as a, out of, as a prosecutor, you can start when you're 25 and most prosecutors uh, will leave by 45 or so. And then, and then many of them are done after that, or just take other types of jobs. A law firm also offers, I see here, prosecutor. And it gets very tiring, by the way, going into court all the time. 45 could be a little bit young, but 55, maybe, you know, that's it. And then the other thing about a law firm that's really good is a law firm teaches you how to get business and then run your own business. And meaning you have clients and those clients will give you ongoing work. And, and that's very powerful. And then that your income is unlimited, depending on whatever you want to do. And then the quality of the work that's expected and a law firm can differ, but generally is generally very high, generally high compared and, and then the highest at best firms and because you're working for paying clients and when the government at best firms. And so those are some of the, the things to think about when you're trying to choose between the government and, and where you want to be. But people that make are making that decision, there's other reasons too. If you work for the government, there's lots of benefits of working for the government and the government has often much better hours, uh, you know, better hours. There's a lot of respect you get from it, working for the government, respecting the community, depending on if you're a prosecutor, um, you're doing something important, uh, arguably more important than a law firm, arguably always, arguably always important almost, arguably always more important, more important. You get that lifetime health insurance many times and, and all, all sorts of other benefits of the government. And it can also lead to politics more easily and, and other things. So there are benefits to the government as well as working in the law firm. And I actually think this would be a good article. So I appreciate you asking this question. And, but I personally, if your goal is to work in a law firm, I would go to work in the smaller town. Okay, let me see. Should I follow up with a thank you note after an interview? I know you mentioned it can be helpful to discuss what you liked about the interviewer. Should I do this right after the interviewer? 
Yes. So you should definitely, when you can, follow up with a thank you note after the interview. And and you don't always need to write the the actual partners and people that you spoke with. And you can sometimes, the recruiting person, but you should say something along the lines of, I enjoyed talking to these three people and appreciate what they said about this. And so you bring back some things that they spoke about. So if one person mentioned attorneys get early experience. So let's just say one person mentioned attorneys get early experience. I don't know, attorney that are like parents. Another person mentioned, let me just see here. Great questions. I love all these questions. One person mentioned that attorneys, let's see, get, one person mentioned they chose the firm over a large firm because of the reputation or so. I don't know, chose firm over a large firm uh, due to reputation and, and quality of work. I don't know, that, that sort of thing. So you would have those two things. And then you would say, I appreciated talking to who told me that, that I love the idea of being able to get early experience and that that was very helpful. And I also enjoyed talking to who told me that and explained that the reasons they chose the firm were because of the reputation and the quality of work that they do compared to, compared to other firms in the city or something. I'd love to be part of that and something along the, those lines. And so if you say those sorts of things, that's uh, very positive and that will jump out at the firm and make them uh, much more enthusiastic uh, about hiring you. You don't always need to write directly to the person that you spoke to. It's often very useful if they hear what you wrote from someone else, but people do like um, that. The thing is people, there's people always want to hire people that want the job. They hire people that want the job. So I've written a lot about thank you notes and stuff, but I, I, I do believe that you don't always need to write to people directly. If the word gets that you wrote something nice to someone else, that actually many times can be much more helpful um, than doing the other opposite. Okay. Okay. This is a great question here. I love this one. If anybody has any follow-ups that ask these questions, I'm also happy to answer them. Okay, this question is, what do you think are the best cities to start my own law firm? Would it be smarter to start my own firm in a small or large market? For instance, should I open a suburb, the metropolitan area where I live or within the city limits? Okay, that's a great question. So that the, the best cities to start your own law firm tend to be, there's a couple, it, it tends to be dependent on a lot of different things. So the best cities to start a law firm. A law firm. So you have a couple of different issues. The first is where you're from is one, but that's often the most logical, especially if you feel like people that you grew up with and stuff think very positively of you and will constantly support you. So where you're from is one. The next one is, and that's just because you'll have a network and, and be able to hopefully talk to other people and have people refer people to. And you know, you'll know neighborhoods and different people and, and all that sort of thing. So that can be helpful. But the other thing to, to keep in mind also is it depends on the practice area. So certain practice areas, if it was me, I would open in larger markets. So you have practice areas like immigration is good for large markets, a trust in estates is good for large markets. And these two practice areas, by the way, also family law to a great extent. Uh, consumer facing practice areas are very good for large markets because, because there's not a lot of competition. Most attorneys do not go into these practice areas and you can do very well for large markets doing consumer facing practice area for large markets. So I, I always recommend if you can to try to go into to the large markets for a lot of these consumer facing practice areas. Now, other ones, like I would say uh, personal injury. It's going to be hard, but you could do it harder in large markets just because of the, the, the cost of advertising and reaching your target audience is going to be much more difficult. But so that, that's how I'd recommend that. But you want to think about what your practice area and where uh, you're most likely to have clients. So I would not open a, I would not open a personal injury law firm in a market with 5,000 people or 3,000 people. And you could. But I would not open, uh, I'm sorry, like a patent law firm in, in a market like that. But but you need to think about in terms of your practice area. Now, if you want to do general practice, you're much better off in, in small markets. You can do general practice in smaller markets, which means you're doing everything for people. Uh, so you can do those in smaller markets. And then if you want to do that, and, and then you also asked, should you open in the suburb of the metropolitan area where you live or should you open the city limits? My uh, advice would be suburb. So I'll just tell you my own history kind of with this. So I actually was thinking about, and I did, opening my own practice when I was practicing law. And, and what I ended up doing was I lived in a city called San Marino, which is outside of Los Angeles next to Pasadena. And I decided while I was practicing law to actually go and pick, and this is before the internet was really going, uh, to take out an ad in the yellow pages and to market my services in San Marino. 
and we're just with an, with an ad and the ad maybe back then costs, I don't know, $6,000 a year. In my first three weeks of having the ad up, I got a, I had, I had multiple clients, meaning I would say six, five plus clients walk in off the street or, or call that were good, were very good clients. One of them was a major divorce. I don't know why this guy hired me, I had no idea what I was doing. The other was a, it was a DUI, but it was like a $20,000 or $30,000 DUI. The guy ultimately paid another attorney and just all these different, because there was, I don't know, there was drugs and it was a wealthy family's child, but there were just all these very good clients that walked in and I couldn't believe it. And so it's, and this would have been hundreds of thousands of dollars and bill of hours. So the point is, and I ultimately uh, didn't take any of these cases or do anything with them because I was in, more interested in recruiting at that point, because I was learning about this business that I'm in and it just made more sense to me. But the point is that I was in a, I was in a suburb and in the suburb, the people wanted to work with people from that suburb. And, and so that was the kind of the issue. Does that make sense? I hope not to work with people from that suburb. From. And having being from an area is very important. Uh, the closer you are to, if you're from an area, like in a suburb, then you can become a go-to person in that area. And that's great. And so you just have to think about in terms of the practice area you're in and the location. But I do think suburbs are better if you want to open your own practice. And just a great question, by the way, if you have any uh, follow-up questions, I'd be happy to answer them. But I, I do think that having your own practice for a lot of attorneys, especially if you want to learn about marketing, having your own business. It's just like an awesome idea. Okay, let's see. How can I develop the right mindset to see myself as a brand and grow my career that way? I feel stuck in the way that I see myself. Okay, give me one second here. I will be back in one second. Just that. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, so yeah, that, that's how I would answer that question. Let me see the next one right now. Okay, how can I develop the right mindset to see myself as a brand and a career? I feel stuck in the way I see myself. Okay, this is a great question in terms of developing the right mindset and to see yourself as a brand. So a lot of what good attorneys do and, and all practice areas for the most part, and depends on where uh, you want to be, is you need to be, become interested in self-improvement related things. And, and that just means like reading about marketing. It means about how you see yourself. It means all those sorts of things. And so I've I've been a student of since I was very, since I was in graduated from law school, actually, no, since I've been in college, I've been a student of all sorts of self-improvement type things. And there's all sorts of, lots and lots of resources that you can do. There's Anthony Robbins, there's, there's Napoleon Hill, there's, there's all sorts of, those are older people. There's all sorts of motivational books and other type, type things and you can review and, and there's just, and there's a lot of things you can find. And so you should really just read about the things that are interested in you, that interest you. The big thing though, is you need to learn how to control your mind and you need to learn how you see yourself and you need to develop routines that, that help that happen. Because most people, Anthony Robbins is a good example. And I used to work with him and, and he developed his mindset by just basically brainwashing himself that he could do all these things and he could, he would be, and, and it's very interesting and you can do that. And most people that become very successful doing anything are able to do that. That's how I would recommend doing what I would recommend in terms of developing the right mindset. And there's all sorts of things that you can, can use to develop your mindset, but you need to be a student of it. And honestly, almost every, like every very successful attorney I know, when I say successful people that have started very successful firms that are really doing really well, people that have been able to become, you know, partners and do very well in law firms. The ones that are really on fire and doing the best are all people that have become students of, of various types of self-improvement because it helps you see the ways way forward. And, and it's just a, a smart thing to do. And it's a lot of people resist it and they think they don't need it. But really, it, everyone that does this sort of stuff uh, benefits from it. It used to be religion would be what people would do. That's another way. And But all this stuff is very important. Okay. Okay. Let me see. Here's an interesting question. Let me see here. A cravat that tells us officially not to worry about hours. It's good you're a cravat. Let's see here. Because they're not bonus and, sa bonus and salary. But it took me until this month to hit 100 hours of legal work. People say it picks up. You'll look back on these days and wish you could redo them, but it isn't picking up. Whether an attorney is at Cravath or another firm with no hours minimum, how are they? How real are they? 
is there a point in which you're in trouble, even if there's no hours minimum? At Cravath, I don't think you're going to have a ton to worry about, but and I don't know what department you're in or what, and I know the Cravath rotates people between different departments, but the, the hours that people do work in a firm, yes. If you're not working a lot of hours, most firms will, That I don't know about Cravath, but most firms will let attorneys go if they're not uh, hitting a certain number of hours after a certain length of time. Now, a firm like Cravath typically is not ever going to lay people off for not making hours, but they will give you indications that they don't like your work and ask you to leave if you're not doing a good job. But you know, most firms will don't have hours, hour maximums and so forth. Uh, even when they say that, they will still expect you to, to leave the firm at some point if you're not working hard. And many times they will lay people off that aren't. Your objective, and I said this earlier, but your objective when practicing law is to do whatever you can to to get to to be stay busy. When an attorney runs out of work, that bad. I said earlier that you, uh, you want to have access to work, so access to work is important, and uh, and so always having work to do and access to work is very important. Um, so if you're not getting work at Cravath, you're not going to get laid off from Cravath, I don't think. But but at most firms, if you were only getting 100 hours of work, that would be a bad sign. And that would mean that the firm doesn't have the work. And and, and, you're, and, if, and if other people are getting the work, that's a big problem. That means you need to find people to give you the work. But that's kind of how I'd recommend that. Um, these are lots of good questions. So is Delaware mostly the litigation battleground for transactional stuff handled elsewhere? Is it plenty of equally more sophisticated transactional work in the Delaware market? So Delaware, typically, I, I would think I did, would, but I it's a market that I do a lot of work in, but it's very, there's not a lot of attorneys that are admitted to the Delaware bar. And so it, it tends to be a, a kind of a much smaller market for, for what I do, but there's a lot of demand there. I, I do think that, I, I don't know, how choice of law works and if people choose Delaware over New York City, for example, for litigation. I do believe that there is a lot of transactional work that does happen in Delaware. So there are plenty of transactional work there and there's also a lot of litigation there. And there's a lot of, there is a lot of demand for litigators there. There, Every big firm is in Delaware and you have, I think Sullivan and Cromwell even is there. Uh, a lot of very big firms are there, but I don't, and I think they actually have fairly significant litigation practices there. I think Sullivan and Cromwell has, or I think Skadden has litigation uh, practice there as well. So there's a lot of very sophisticated work there, but I don't know the amount of the work. I do know that in terms of us making placements there and the demand for attorneys there, it, it tends not to be that large because even though there's a lot of very sophisticated work, it's a much smaller type market. Okay, here's a great question. Let's see. Okay, this person says, I went in-house as a third-year corporate associate. Pay is good, 225 base with potential bonus bringing that up to 270,000. Wow. The only problem seems the job seems very limited and the work has shifted from the responsibilities and she'll advertise. So I'm doing mostly NDAs. Wow, huge volume of these every day. That's funny. I'm trying to stay put because of the economy. So it looks like I was in the job for at least one year on my resume, but I'm worried about what I think I can do next. I don't want to go to a big firm and I worry I won't have much to talk about in another legal job interview. FWI Doom, the practice that law firm is not very useful companies. Think finance and banking. Should I look for a new job? No, I don't think you should look for a new job. You certainly can, but if you are making all this money and they're paying you uh, to do this work, there's really, unless it's a different type of experience you want, then I don't know that you need to. If they're having you do NDAs for $270,000 a year, I, I understand that may be somewhat limiting, but it is important for you, I think, to have some stability and to stay somewhere uh, several years and just try to get maybe different types of experience in-house and try to look at what's happening. My concern would be making sure that your career can advance and you want to do whatever you can to, to make sure your career is consistently advancing and, and you're doing better. And, and that's, and, but you're going to hold yourself back if you leave, because people are going to think that you won't stick around your next job. And that's one of the problems with going in house many times. The jobs are not represent what they represent. There tends not to be as much employment stability as in a lot of law firms. And, and so if you can find uh, a much better in-house position, then that's great. And maybe you can look, but I personally wouldn't, but you're, it sounds like you haven't been there very long. You're only three or four years out of law school and are four years out of law school, I, I would probably 
uh, try to stick around and see if there's any room to advance and, and maybe lightly look for a job. So if something looks very good, then I would try to do that. But I, I don't know that looking for a job right now is the right thing to do because no job is going to be perfect. And part of the reason people go in-house is because they, they do want to do a different type of work with less stress. And one of the big complaints that people have about in-house jobs is many times that the most sophisticated work is done by law firm. That to some extent may be what you chose to do by going in-house is taking a less demanding job. So if it was me, probably, I, I probably would not want to stay there, but, but my advice would be you probably should and just enjoy it as long as you feel like your, your position's safe and then lightly look for a job, but not an all out job search. And find something where you really do believe there's a future. But most of your concerns are probably going to be present in most other places you'd go to work. So most uh, other in-house employers are going to have, are going to, there's going to be similar problems with the job in terms of the level of uh, challenge, the a lot of times repetitive work, not feeling like you're getting the good experience. Most of the good experience, by the way, when you go in-house is done by law firms and uh, in-house are really using you to do NDAs and so forth because they don't want to pay outside attorneys to do those. And they're saving money by having you do that, which is smart for them, but obviously not the best thing for your career. Okay. Okay. Are there any good marketing books that you would recommend reading? Let's see here. Yeah. So there's lots of good marketing books. There's, I love marketing books. There's, there's, I, I could talk about marketing books all day, but one of the best ones, I think I, I, Used to like stuff by a guy named Jay Abraham. He has good stuff, but he's never sold a lot of books, but he's a marketing guy that I used to really enjoy reading about. And he talks about a lot of things. There's another book called Positioning that I really, there's another book called, I don't know, The 22 Laws of Marketing. I mean, these are just kind of classics, 22 laws or 22 immutable laws, the laws of marketing. There's another book called by Robert Cialdini, I think, or Cialdini. There's another book called, those are some of the good ones. One of the best ones that I like. And there's a lot of, and once you start reading those, you'll find others. But these books right here are, uh, these three books are, are, are some real classics and uh, good ones. And there's just a lot of marketing books out there and that you can read and that can help you. But th those are three that I would recommend. Okay. Let's see. Here. And just when you find those books, you can, when you read about marketing or anything, my advice is to, to try to find books that appeal to you. Uh, so it's not, you shouldn't just read what I'm telling you to. You should go and review and read things that you find personally very interesting, because if you find them interesting, then you're more likely to read them. And if you're more likely to read them, then you'll be much better off. Okay. I'm a 2L struck out at OCI. I've got a summer off with an in-house legal department that does a kind of work that if you'd asked me when I started law school, I told you that I'd like to be doing after being in private practice for a time. That's not bad. I've also received a paying offer from a PI group that is pretty prestigious in the same general space as the corporate group, but more policy litigation focused. My dream practice and not something I really think I'd have a shot at getting given my pedigree. Neither of these organizations is necessarily going to lead to a long-term position, though it seems to be about whether a relevant position opens up at the right time. Both are, of course, very different experiences. I guess I'm asking whether you think one is better than the long-term play. If I were a 1L summer, I wouldn't hesitate to take the latter role because I'm so spooked by striking out at OCI. I don't trust my judgment at all. Okay, well, you didn't strike out at OCI, but the thing I would tell people with OCI is you can certainly interview with firms through your school, but you should also be looking for positions in other markets where, you know, in firms that don't come to your school. A lot of, even the most prestigious schools, like I went to um, a pretty prestigious school in the University of Virginia, and there were hardly any firms from Chicago that came there, and there were none from Detroit, which is where I'm from. So you can't, so you have to really apply to, and there were hardly any from California back then, maybe three firms like Brobeck, Latham, and well, Brobeck doesn't even exist anymore, or maybe Old Melbourne. So you have to, so OCI is not, you should be looking for jobs many times in other ways than OCI. What I would recommend from, for, from you is making the decision to do PI is a long-term career decision. And I don't, if it's a prestigious firm, then that's great, but PI can be all over the map. So what that means is it could be a, a PI firm that does very high end PI, or it could be a, a PI firm that does low end PI. It could be a PI firm that does a very complex work, or it could be a PI firm that uh, doesn't do complex work. And PI is a lot different than general commercial litigation. With general litigation, you have to come up with all sorts of theories to defend things. And with PI, you're pretty much you have the injury, 
And so it's, you're almost always going to get a trial and get to court. Whereas if you have a contract claim and so forth, it can be very difficult to get to court. And so they need very smart attorneys that argue on both sides and so forth. So PI is a little bit different. In terms of in-house, you're talking about the firm does the kind of work that you'd like to be doing after being in private practice. That sounds like ideal. It sounds to me like you were able to sell yourself on that. If you go down PI, the problem is that's one direction that you almost can't go back from because uh, the PI, the problem with PI, let me just hear. The problem with PI is, um, it's actually a strength, but it's also a, a weakness. The, the problem with PI is that the work from a litigation standpoint isn't that complex. And, and the reason it's not that complex is because you are, you have the injury, the injury exists. And so it's not, it's, it's much different than trying to prove a contract claim or, or something along those lines where people can argue and that sort of thing. The other problem with, with PI is that PI attorneys make money when, when they get settlements or when they get a verdict, a settlement or a verdict. And so because of that, the the salaries tend to be much lower. So the salaries are much lower as a general rule because people basically make money and spend it, make money. And then because the work isn't as complex, that the quality of the attorneys does not need to be, of attorneys does not need to be extremely high in terms of smarts, I guess is a way to put it, smarts. Not street smarts, but smarts because getting to trial and so forth is not, is not as hard. So it becomes, when you're, when you're in PI, it becomes a lot more about many times your personality, ability to move juries, ability to settle cases, all those sorts of things and connect with clients. And so it's just a different type of skill. And there's certain people that are very good at it, but um, you certainly do not need to do well in law school or go to a good law school to do most forms of PI. Now, there are some very sophisticated forms like mesothemioma. I don't even know how to spell it. That's a semioma. Who the hell knows how to spell that word? But, you know, and that's fairly sophisticated and there can be a lot of money involved. But for the most part, that's a big problem with PI. So if you go into PI, you should be pretty convinced that's what you want to do as a career. And you can do extremely well if you start your own practice or if you learn how to do it and you get good at it. But it's definitely its own career path. And most PI attorneys do not ever go into in-house later on. So if you have an in-house opening now, opening in a practice area that you like, then that actually might be a good thing uh, compared to doing PI. If it was me, I probably would choose PI just because I think it'd be fun to learn about. But PI is a perfect example of a practice where you're opening your own business. Okay. Okay. Let's see. Do big law firms hire summer after three L's have graduated? Should I keep looking while studying for the bar? Yes. So big law firms do, uh, well, no, they don't, they, oh, after graduation. Yes. That they're always, they're always hiring if the right people come along. Come along. It's much more difficult to get a job as a 3L though, after your 3L, if you haven't worked in a big firm, but I would keep looking. If you don't have a big job, a big law firm after the summer, if you haven't had one in the summer, then it does become much more difficult to get one. But just the other thing to remember is that your career is a long race. You'll be, you don't need to get a job right away. So that's, you don't need, and you also do not necessarily need to start in a big firm to get to one. Okay. Questions here. This person says, let's see here. I'm a junior in a niche transaction group and interested in lateraling into a more general corporate position. Do you know how to position myself for this or if any firms would be open to talk to someone like this? Yeah. So I think that firms would be interested. It sounds that, that you can definitely do that. I would think about why you want to do that. Many times if you're in a niche transaction group, that's a real benefit because uh, there's not a lot of people that uh, would do that type of work you do. So if you have a very niche experience, then, then that actually, that, that could be very helpful for you. So I would recommend doing what you can to maybe stick with that. If you do lateral into one of these uh, practice groups, then it's going to be uh, much more difficult for you in the long run to potentially find another position than if you're in the niche practice group. I, may, I don't know what your niche practice group is, but if that niche practice group is something that, that not a lot of people do, then that may actually be a very good idea for you because it'll, it'll be uh, something that not a lot of people can do. But M&A and capital markets, in order to, to be hired by a firm in, in one of those practice groups, the most important thing and the smartest thing you could possibly do would probably be to apply to a lot of places that have openings for one. But the places that are most likely to hire you are going to be firms that are not as good as where you are, uh, where you are, or 
firms in smaller markets. Uh, the reason that firms in smaller markets would be good is because firms in smaller markets typically want more general and, and they will and they will also and they will also like your big firm experience. I'm assuming you're at a big firm if you're in a very niche practice. And it doesn't when I say smaller market, like if you're in I mean that that means not as big of a market. If you're in Charlotte, North Carolina, that means maybe working in I don't know, it's just not as big of a market as that. Okay. Experience. So that's how I would approach that. But but I would also think about why you want to go into one of these other practice areas, because when it comes down to it, the, there's differences in each, but you'd have to, is it because you, because if you're going to be more marketable in one of these practice areas, is it because there's some special reason, like you find one of these other practice areas more interesting? Is it is it because you want to go in-house and you think these will make you more marketable? Before you actually uh, ask that question, I would just say, what is it that you're looking for in the long term? Let's see here. Okay, so this says here, I've heard that corporate associates, especially in New York, can do litigation pro bono projects with the office partners on board. Have you seen this happen? What's the best way to ask for it? I don't want anyone to think I'm trying to switch to litigation and I don't want to entirely lose that experience. So yeah, you can um, certainly do that if that's something you're interested in. I have seen people do that. The problem is when people are evaluating you, they're going to want to ask that when they're evaluating your firm, they would prefer that you make them money rather than do that work. And But I don't think that there's certainly anything wrong with doing uh, that type of work and doing something else. I, and if you're, and if you have the time at your firm and you can put in the effort, I think that'd be great. I don't see anything wrong with it. And you certainly can. And if you're not interested in switching to litigation, that's good. So it's just, you know, you're committed to the practice of law and you want to do that. I don't think there's any problem. The only concern that I would have is you just don't want that to impact your hours or anything that you're currently doing at your existing firm. And you do want to look committed, but I think that's great. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I just would be careful about anything that looks like you may not be committed to what you're doing. The next question is, how do you market yourself to a company's in-house technology department or technology company's in-house department? So the best way of doing that typically is uh, just to find out whoever the technology company is. You can write the general counsel. Many times the, the in-house companies also do not have, not even have a legal department. And then you can have a CEO. So that's, I've done a lot of this, by the way, in the past for people. But that's typically the best way of doing it. Typically, when you do write someone about it, you're always better off writing the CEO unless it's like a public company or something. Uh, you know, company, no, but private company, yes. But so that's how I would recommend doing that. I, the other way is you want to, you know, talk about why you want to work there and maybe some connection or what you can do for them in your cover letter. So that would be important. Okay. Oh, sorry. Answer that, I guess. Okay. My vault. Awesome questions today. Uh, my Vault 3040 New York firm requested a reference list during a background check and actually contact my past. Should I be worried? Is a common practice for SA program? Oh, yeah. So it's not common, but it is more common now. And I don't know if your past employer did tell you about this, and I don't think you need to be worried. The, the general rule, by the way, with law firms is most law firms, not all, but most law firms will not say bad things about people bad things about people when giving references. And so they realize that there may have been mistakes with the person in the past. They they don't want to be, they don't want to position themselves poorly. So I've seen very few law firms give bad references. I've seen the very best law firms, like the, the you know, top law firms, almost never give bad references. They just refuse. They won't say anything negative and never give bad references. And the other thing that's interesting is the better the attorney many times, Meaning, ask the one asked for the reference. The more likely they are not, to, they are more likely the references are always going to be positive. So where you start seeing issues with references many times are when the attorney is actually not when the when the attorney being asked for the reference is not a great attorney or when it's not a great firm and so forth like that. That I hate to say that I don't know why that is. If you've worked at really good places before, unless you've done something just really badly or, or bad, I'm sorry, or really upset some people, the odds you getting a poor reference are, are pretty slim. Now, it's not to say I haven't seen people get bad references. But for the most part, people do not give bad references. Many times, small markets will ice people out, uh, small markets. 
ice people out. I've seen people, meaning like if you upset someone in a small market, they'll make sure that you have a hard time working there. A large market, it's very rare. We get bad references. Now, if one partner's calling another partner uh, about you, which typically does not happen for young associates or summer associates, then what'll happen in those conversations is they may actually say something and it could be negative, but they may say it in a way where it's not really direct. So they might say something like, this person is very green and I'm not, which means that they're not mature. And I'm worried they're going to stay green or something. I, I don't know, something along those lines. Or, But I very rarely see attorneys talk negatively about other attorneys. It's just when uh, the good, best attorneys, they just, it's just not, it's not a nice thing to do. And the, I, the reason they don't, especially more mature attorneys, the best ones is because they know that something bad will likely happen to them in the future. And it does reflect negatively. And then they know if they talk badly about someone that you would also talk negatively about them and so forth. So talking poorly about people is not a cool thing. It's actually in the legal profession, people are much more likely not to talk poorly than, than I've seen in a lot of in most other professions. Attorneys kind of tend to, even though they are adverse and stuff, they do tend to be pretty good about uh, not talking negatively about one another. So I wouldn't be that worried, especially if you're like a summer associate or something like it's just, you're not far enough along that anything that someone says makes a difference. So you might have done some stupid things, but you're just in the learning stage. Huh. Let's see, what are your opinion on the legal sourcing sites like LegalZoom and so forth that connect lawyers with clients? So those types of sites can be good. The problem is, as many times they will send the leads out to multiple people. And, and so you have to be the one that gets it. They'll also, and I don't know about LegalZoom, I'm just saying in general, what a lot of those sites will do. They also um, will can be difficult to, to close the people. So a lot of times they'll send poor leads, poor leads out. Uh, they won't send their best cases to you. They, so in my opinion, you're always better off developing your own lead source, but you can't always, of course. No, lead source. Uh, so you can't, you certainly can't do that all the time. If you do use a site like LegalZoom and so forth, that's good. There's lots of good sources. There can be bar associations, uh, are good. And then there's local and uh, practice specific, practice specific. And, and then, and all those other types of those lead sources you can use too, like LegalZoom. I would just, I would become a student of them and, and learn about them and how they work. And I think they certainly could work. I'm not saying they can't, I don't know enough about them, but I, that, that is a good idea, I think, is to use those, but, but ultimately you're going to be better off developing your own lead source. So if somebody's searching for like an immigration attorney in, I don't know, Rochester, New York, you could very easily come up in the search results and as a recommended firm, just by having a, being listed with Google on, as a business that does nothing but that. And then you would probably get more leads than LegalZoom and that sort of thing. So you just have to understand a little bit about search engines and so forth. And that's another thing that I would recommend if you're opening your own practice, uh, using something like that. Okay, let's see here. Okay, these are, these are great questions. So many great questions. Um, let's see here. As a recruiter, prospective employee, how would you pitch a candidate with experience in the lower range law firm in a way that instills candidates, that, that instills confidence in the candidate and gives preference over candidates with more experience? Okay, well, the biggest thing is that law firms are always asking. They're asking the, the three questions, and I always talk about this. They ask, can you do the job? Do the job. No. And then they're asking, I mean, there are other questions too, but, you know, will you do the job long-term, long-term, meaning will you stay? And, and then do you want the job? Now, these are not questions that they're, they're asking directly. They're, this, these are just questions that they're thinking of in their mind. So can you do the job is really, especially if you're just a third year or two years, odds are you can do the job, whatever it is. You can figure stuff out and, and you'll... Yeah. You can figure things out and, and you'll pretty much be in good shape right away. So you definitely, anybody can do the job. But the idea is, can you do the job long-term means, will, do you look like, is this something you're committed to? Are you committed to this practice area? Are you committed, are you, are you committed to practice area, this area? Are you committed to location? All those sorts of things. Does the law firm look like a place where you'd want to work long, like a long time? And then the final one is, do you really want the job? So what I would basically, the way I would pitch someone would be that I would try to make it seem your experience is very good. I would say that you have the right experience, but what makes you so special is that you really want this job. 
and you want this job because you've had the dream of doing this, or you've had all this experience, and you, you've taken all these classes, you've done extra reading, or you've done something on your own that's related to that, you're going to stay because this, is, this firm offers you the best form for it and you want to do it. And then the other thing I would also try to do is I try to make the firm like you. And I would try to make the firm like you by, by saying positive things about you and your hobbies or things you've overcome and that sort of thing, which you can't necessarily do on your own, which is a service that kind of, you can, but you'd have to do it in interviews, but you can't certainly talk about the things that have happened to you that you've overcome. But wanting the job is really the most important and making sure the firm can understand that and just not screwing around. So the firm needs to understand that. And, and typically the idea is if somebody really wants something, then they're more likely to stick around. They're more likely to be good. They're more likely to uh, improve and they're more likely to continually get better at something over the long run. And so a lot of attorneys will take jobs and then they won't even though they can do the work, they won't stick around or even though they are they don't really want it, they're looking for something else. So we've talked to several people today already, and we've talked to the person that's in an in-house job where they may have wanted the job, but now they're not being challenged and they're looking for a job or someone that got a job doing personal injury and then also some sort of in-house work that doesn't really want either job. And so you need to, law firms, when they think, when an employer thinks that you really want the job, and this just keeps coming up, and you can see this over and over again, this, not, this, this person is in a niche transactional group that somehow they got hired for, but they don't really want the job. But this firm, this person, let's see, is, doesn't really want either of these jobs. This person doesn't want this job, actually, this in-house person. So the, all these people that are asking questions, a lot of them don't really want the job. And so that's, if you can convince somebody they want the job, then it's a good business decision to hire you. And if you don't want the job, then it's not a good business decision to hire you. Okay, let's see. Okay, so this first question is, okay. you are a first-year associate at a big law firm. How do you go about establishing your own brand? and generating your own clients while meeting the demands of your supervising attorneys and other partners? Okay, well, that's a great question. If you're a first-year associate at the law firm, my advice to you is your first three years in any law firm, you really should just be working like crazy, learning all you can, and becoming indispensable. You do not need to generate business right away. You need to become like an expert. And typically, it takes at least three years in a law firm to, to know what you're doing and become an expert. So I, I really do not recommend you, your brand, your early brand as an attorney needs to be related to doing good work. Your brand, your brand should be available, competent, meaning thorough, hardworking, working, committed, dedicated, improving, all those sorts of things and compared and, and compared to other people. And, and that's what people want. So that's all you need to worry about your first three years. And then you should be just absorbing everything you possibly can of, from the people around you and becoming better and better. What you need to do your first three years. You don't need to worry about getting business because you want people to, you, you really want to become the absolute best attorney you can be. Because what's going to happen with the brands of other attorneys, which I'm sure you'll, you're probably already seeing, so the brands of other attorneys, most attorneys in big firms or most law firm attorneys, as a general rule, their brand will become available, reluctant, thorough sometimes, hardworking when necessary, not committed, looking in house, in house, sorry, in house, firms, firms, you know, gossipy, all those sorts of things. So you have to think about, so you want your brand to, to be the best and proving and I would also say positive. And so you just want to be on the side of all these good things. And that's what your brand needs to be as a young attorney. Because if you have that stuff as a young attorney, you're going to become uh, much more effective later on. Okay, let's see here. So many good questions. Okay. I'm a contract document review attorney. I love this work a lot. How to mark myself to do a document review attorney uh, Continuously, is it possible to find uh, great and do full-time work for a great law firm? Yes. So if you like doing document review, I would become, and that's actually awesome. I love that someone's saying this because most people, when they talk about their practice area, especially document review, talk about they don't like it. So you need to become, uh, what I would recommend doing is becoming an expert in e-discovery. And, and all law firms uh, need good people to do that. And not only that, but if you become an expert in e-discovery, you can potentially make more money than the many associates in the law firm, or even it's a major skill. You need to become very good at that. And 
to develop. So I would recommend doing whatever you can to, to, to develop that skill. Can you, wait. yeah, so I would do that. And yes, you can, if anybody, if you become a document review attorney, then you can become an expert in e-discovery. You can supervise people doing that. And it's an industry that's always changing. And so I think this is a great question. And that, that's one of the things that, that I like, really like about this question is any practice area, whatever you're doing, my advice is my advice is to become the best you possibly can become the best and the top and whatever the best you can. Because most people, what they do is they become a document review attorney and then they just leave it at that. And they don't continually try to become better and better. And you know, what you're saying here is just awesome. You're saying I'm a document review attorney, but I want to be, get better and better at this. And I want to continually um, improve. And I love this. And I want to work in big firms and you can work in the biggest, if you become committed to this, because very few people are, you can become anything you want to be. You can work in the biggest firms. You can be ahead of the discovery there. You may one day start a company doing this. You have a great future ahead of you because very few people find something that they like. And, and this is a great, find something you like. Sorry. Give me one second. I'm sorry. So this is just a, a great, great statement in terms of what you should be should be doing with your time. And finding something that you like is extremely important. And very few people do that. And you should do that. Anybody can do that in any practice area. You should be able to do that in any practice area or any environment or whatever. It doesn't matter. It could be pro bono. It could be, but doing having something that you enjoy is very important because the more you're doing stuff that you enjoy, the better off you'll be. Okay, that's great. And just give me one second. I have to, I'm just going to grab some coffee and someone didn't raise their hand. Let me just see here. Okay, I will talk to this person real quickly. One second. Oops, sorry. I'll be back in one second. Okay, sorry, that. I'm back. Let's see here. And someone, I think, raised their hand. One person, uh, let me see how that worked. And if someone raises their hand, I, I can be happy to let you talk if you want. I don't see if anybody. Okay, someone have a question. No. Okay, I'll figure this out in a little bit. Okay, so let me do the next one here. Let me just hear. Okay, next question. Is it unprofessional or politically unwise to seek another job opportunity after securing one with a big firm? The work you'll be doing in a big firm is generalized and the other firm is specialized. Essentially, should you preserve prestige over specialization for your career development or specialization or prestige over the good firm? These are great questions. It depends on the, the market that you're in. So in, in most, if you're in a major market, then you're almost always better off being more specialized. But but my recommendation would be early in your career is to be to work in the best firm you can. So the best firm you can is almost like it's almost like the quality of the law school you go to. It, it will set it'll set you up for other things later on. So my recommendation would be I, I don't most large law firms are not going to you're not going to be that general. You're not going to be that general. So my recommendation would be to early in your career to try to work in the best possible law firm you can, and then and then later on become more specialized. But you can even become specialized in a large law firm. I don't know what kind of specialization you're talking about, but most large law firms are specialized. You may be doing only one type of litigation, or you may be doing different types of litigation in a large law firm as opposed to one, and it's more specialized. But I would recommend working in the best law firm. Now you're talking, let me see, okay, so you're actually... You, you, doing the big law firm, general, uh, other firms specialize. So I think what you're talking about here is potentially going to um, a firm that only does one thing. And if you are, there are firms that do that do like only tax law or IP, uh, IP, healthcare, that sort of thing. And you, so your question may be, does it make sense to go to a firm that does only one of those things? And in general, a lot of niche practice here, a lot of smaller firms that do, do only one thing. Some of them have been around a long time, but it's, it's actually very dangerous. So a lot of them have not fared very well and tend to have a lot of problems when competing with general practice firms. That's not always the case, but the problem with a lot of these very specialized law firms is that the, the attorneys cannot refer work back and forth to one another. So if a corporate matter comes into a IP firm, they have to get an IP, they have to get a corporate firm involved and so forth. So you need to be very careful many times if it's a, if it's a specialized law firm, because that, that those firms, a lot of times are, are do are, many of them, at least in my experience have had uh, problems in the past, but they don't always have problems, but they will have, pro have had a lot of problems staying in, in business and with, with more generalized firms with, with very highly defined practice areas, spring it up all over. Let me see here. Okay, let me see. 
Hello. It's hard to see the ethical boundaries when it pertains to the way I'm allowed to promote my legal business. What do you recommend as a basic and safe way to promote my business in a small town other than newspapers? The best way to promote your business is really to be online. You need to have a, a website and then the website should have uh, articles and other information. You can do things uh, with social media. You can do things with, you can, you should be going to, you know, community events and handing out cards and getting known around the community. You should, you know, tell people what you do, tell everyone what you do for a living. If you're in a smaller market, tell everyone what you do and pretty much all these sorts of things. And there are ethical boundaries, of course, to how you promote your business. But for the most part, you really do want to do whatever you can to promote your business in, a, in an ethical way. But you know, most attorneys that are promoting business are going to community events. They're telling others what they do. They're, they have a website. They, you know, they network with other attorneys that refer business. To them. And those are typical ways that things are done. Okay, uh, let's see here. And there's a lot of articles that I've written about how to promote your business. I would review those online on um, the BCG website if you can. Okay, thank you for this presentation. I have a question related to my career. I just moved to the U.S. from overseas. I'm working with International Humanitarian NGO. I applied for asylum here and I want to start my career here. My question is due, is due to I can't practice law or how do I take the legal certificate from here? I don't know. I, I don't know the best way to, to become, I don't think it's, I, I don't know that you need a, a certificate to be a paralegal in most states. I do think you could probably get a job in a law firm. I think anyone can get a job in a law firm. And a lot of paralegals, most paralegals that I've known don't have any official type of certification or anything. I don't think that's necessarily going to be a problem for you. So I would recommend that you, yeah, I, I don't, I think if you do get an LLM, uh, I don't know that foreigners, people that are from foreign countries can work in, uh, less, if you can be admitted to the, the, the Nevada bar with an LLM, you may be able to be, I don't know, but I guess you'd have to look into that. And I don't know if you practice law in the country that you came over from either. I hope that helps. Let's see here. Okay, let's see here. What is a good, oh, this is a good question. This is kind of fun. What is a good marketing budget for a plaintiff's attorney near Chicago. I was told my monthly amount should be 10% of what you earn annually. I do um, 12,000 a year, 120 a month. I think that most of the marketing that you need to do, especially when you're getting started, it doesn't have to involve spending a lot of money. I think you can, you should concentrate and you should learn about social media marketing, online marketing stuff. So you can hopefully drive people to your website and, and that sort of thing. So I would, I don't know that $120 a month is going to do much for you. I think you're much better off spending that time. And I'm just, this is just an example. So if you're billing 1.2 million, you'd say 120. I think that having that kind of rule of 10% is a good idea. I just don't know if that is really going to move the needle much. So most marketing that you do, by the way, you can do on your own and you can learn most forms of marketing on your own. Now, I'm not saying I, I certainly do a lot of marketing and that I pay for, but most marketing, I think you can do on your own without having to, to pay anybody to do it. So a good marketing budget is typically what you can afford and what you think. But I, I do know that a lot of plaintiff's attorneys, one of the issues, one, I remember one time I met a, a plaintiff's attorney, I was running some office space from them. And, and this was a guy that had, you know, advertised on the back of phone books and all sorts of things. And I said to him, why are you doing all this advertising and these phone books? Because I said, well, the only reason we do it is because if we, we stop doing it, then the phone stops ringing. And you'll typically notice the most successful uh, people in personal injury and other practice areas do like that, do a lot of advertising. It's useful and it's something uh, that you should be doing. Okay. Thank you. I'm getting to all these questions. There are a lot of questions. I have an associate position offer at a boutique commercial litigation firm in Miami, but my goal is to specialize in international law and a larger firm in DC or New York City. If you work in a small firm, how difficult is it to uh, transition to a large firm in the future? And when should you make the transition? Okay. The first thing is, I don't, if it's a boutique firm, that means boutique typically means great firm. And so if you're working around, it's not going to be too difficult to uh, transition to another market. And people do go from you know, Miami to DC or New York all the time. So it's not going to be independent on the quality of the attorneys you're working with. It's not going to be that difficult to make the transition. Uh, a lot of what I spoke about today in terms of branding and so forth, the, the more contacts you have in that market, the better if you're trying to relocate to a large market. But it's going to be very difficult for you if international law and you're not practicing international law 
it, it's going to be difficult for you to transition probably to a, to a larger market without okay. any formal that's experience. Space. So that's just an international loss. You can't just do practice commercial litigation in Miami and then suddenly do international law. I guess you could, okay. but so, for okay. a larger firm, larger firms, the problem okay. is the thing that everyone needs to understand, and a lot of attorneys don't, is when law firms are hiring people, they have a lot of options. When law firms are making lateral hiring decisions, lateral hiring decisions, they're hiring someone that has international law experience. Come on, go already. Will you have a printer? Uh, damn it. Experience versus an in in the market, so in New York City, versus someone with no experience, no international Where would you? from Miami. And you just have to ask yourself. Really? So that's just that you have to put yourself in the shoes of the employer. So the only way you're going to be able to make that transition is if you're able to uh, somehow convince the firm that you're going to be the better fit than anybody else that you you possibly, can, you, you'd have to have I do some connections in New York City or, or DC you know, if you have to have some, some have some sort of niche experience that they could use that international law experience for so yeah, but those are the main things you need so. to keep in mind with all that and with an assumption um, if not just um, leave it there don't pay and fix it but most probably you'll have the suction and it'll be fine. You know, can ask them. Yeah, or her. I am worried. I worry that I'm jeopardizing my license by working at a general practice law firm that offers no mentor services or guidance. It allows me a great level of discretion in managing cases. I worry. I'm uncomfortable about this. But my plan review review expressed that he's pleased with my work. Would you recommend leaving the law firm to enter? I mean, so I mean, malpractice claims or to stay. The first thing is if you get sued for malpractice at your firm, um, the firm probably will cover, you know, well, I don't, you know, defend you, but I don't know how soon what you're dealing with specifically. I don't think lawyers do not lose their license for the most part. And I'm not an expert in this. When I see people that have lost their license, in most cases, they've done something ethically shocking. And in almost all cases, it involves taking money or stealing money from clients. And even those people, most of the times don't get disbarred. So it's pretty difficult to get disbarred unless you've done something just absolutely horrible. If you forget a filing or something, you're probably not going to get disbarred. If you if you ruin a case somehow, you're probably not even going to get disbarred unless you do something negative and intentional. So um, I've seen attorneys do some of the worst things and even blowing deadlines, there's usually, you know, forms and things you can file basically saying you didn't know what you were doing, you made a mistake and uh, you get around that. So uh, I don't think you're... Oh, you know, I, someone raised their hand. I think that's what it is. Hi, sorry about that. I think we had someone's hand had raised and I called on them, but they didn't work talking. Okay, but yeah, so that's, I, would I recommend leaving the firm? I would, if you're getting really good experience there, then I would potentially stay, but I would leave in order to get more training. So if you can work with people that will train you more, it sounds like you might be like in an insurance defense firm or something. I, I don't know what kind of work you're doing. But I would recommend working someplace where you feel like you can get a little bit more training. That could be very helpful. Okay, let's see here. Okay, how important is it to disclose my current job status laid off for a job or interview? So if you've been laid off, you just need to put your last day of uh, employment on your on your resume. And so you don't want to, and, and, if the, and if the employer, and if you've been laid off while you're interviewing or around that time, then you should send the employer, just say, here's an updated resume and, and send that to them. The, you do need to disclose that to people. Now, most times, uh, depending on where you're laid off from, you should always try to negotiate a um, being able to stay on the website and use your voicemail and so forth for a, a certain length of time with the employer. A lot of employers will allow you to do that, or most of them will. And and you should be as clear, do whatever you can to try to keep that, just to stay active as long as you possibly can on the website. Okay. And, and But you do need to disclose it. If they find out you've been laid off later on uh, while before checking references and stuff, they, they're not going to like it. But if, if the employer is allowing you, if your past employer is allowing you to to not stay on the web or not allowing you to stay on the website and so forth, then you do need to disclose it. And you can certainly say it. And there's nothing wrong with being laid off. And lots of people are laid off. And, and especially right now, I, I get people jobs every week that have been laid off. So there's nothing really to worry about. Okay. Okay, this question is, how do I transition from structured finance at big law into another practice here outside of that practice? Finance within corporates is general corporate partnership law or transition something like trust and estates. So my biggest piece of advice for this is this transition from a, a major firm and in, inside of a major firm is difficult. So it's difficult unless unless the major unless you can do so where you're at. So my first piece of uh, advice is try to do so at your current firm. 
your current firm. And if you can't do it, if you cannot do it, then my next piece of advice is to go to a smaller firm where where you can be more of a generalist, you can be more of a generalist or do something else. Or you can also go to a smaller market. So the thing about smaller markets is most smaller markets, if you work, if you work like in a market like New York City, like you're going to be like in structured finance. But if you take your experience in structured finance and you move to a market, say Atlanta, or in a mid-sized firm there, or you move to a large firm in even Memphis or or wherever, or Wisconsin, or, or you know, most U.S. markets. The, the attorneys are generalists. So in smaller markets and smaller firms, the attorneys tend to be more generalists. So you could do general corporate in a smaller market. And that's typically what you should do is if you want to do more of a general practice, then the larger firms charge higher rates and they also charge to their clients because they have specialists. And then clients go to the larger cities because they're specialists. But if you want to do something more general, you're always better off working in a smaller market or smaller firm. Larger law firms, the pressure is always going to be towards doing very specialized work. Okay. So that was a good question. This question here. Let's see here. Oh, give me one second. Okay, where can I win? These are just great questions. I really appreciate everyone asking all these questions. Where can I practice or see what the work is like for various practice areas in order to determine which practice area I like? Learning it in law school is not the same, especially since it is mostly litigation-based. Even talking to people is different than actually having to draft a contract. Do I describe the blogs? And entertainment? So you're interested in entertainment law. Okay, so entertainment law, you have to decide like why you want to do a certain practice area. So like a lot of times people are interested in entertainment law because they just the entertainment. And, but entertainment law is really about contracts, light IP most times, and some light maybe like corporate work or and sometimes arbitrations and litigation. So you have to decide what the practice, why you're interested in the practice area. So I don't like it when people say, and a lot of people say they want to go into entertainment law. And really what they do is they, they like entertainment or they like the idea of being around entertainers or they just enjoy, they were maybe they were entertain, into entertainment when they were younger. And then people, because of the market I'm in Los Angeles, everyone always wants to come and do entertainment and they don't really necessarily understand entertainment because for the most part, there's not a lot of money involved in entertainment law because the projects tend to be very short. They're not long, big term. There's not like big flows of money coming in and the work's not sophisticated enough because the biggest, when there's giant corporate transactions and IPOs and so forth, you need very sophisticated attorneys that can charge a lot of money. Or when there's very sophisticated uh, litigation, you need very sophisticated. And, and there tends to be money that's spent over a long period of time on those types of attorneys. But in this type of entertainment law, it's just a lot different. So in order to understand what a practice area is about, you, you do things. I know someone that was interested in entertainment law and they had joined, started joining. They were a divorce attorney, actually. And he started joining all sorts of entertainment networking groups and entertainment societies and, and meeting attorneys in different practice areas and got very involved in that. And that was a smart thing for him. And, and it helped him become, and, and he actually had a background in music, which is why he liked entertainment law. And, and he wanted to be around that. But the practice area that you choose and you go into should have more to do with where your skill set is than and what your interests are and the type of work that you feel like you can be good at as opposed to just the, the type of people you're dealing with. So a lot of times people that think that they like business want to may want to go into corporate law, but doing you know, structured finance transactions may not be necessarily about business. It's about a form of work and different types of work involve different thinking processes. A lot of corporate, like you know, the patent law involves scientific thinking processes and Real estate and corporate many times involve mathematical type and thinking processes. And litigation, of course, involves a lot of writing and, and those sorts of thinking processes. And family law involves drama and thinking process. So it's just, you have to decide what makes you the most comfortable and then go into that. And that's the best advice that I can provide you. But I, you should never go into a, a practice area because of, of how it, it, it looks sexy or it looks, and I'm not saying that's why you want to go into entertainment law, but you should choose it because the work and the type of thing you're doing is compatible with what your interests are. Like litigators tend, tend to like writing, and but not always, but for the most part. And, and you can choose things, doing things like that. So let's see here. If a big law firm doesn't give a formal reference, what would stop 
them from backdoor references. Yeah, they do give backdoor references. So many times someone, and they won't, will only do it most of the time after you've actually gotten an offer or they're ready to give you an offer. But they, if a partner is investigating another partner, they may call someone that they know or an associate sometimes when they're at the point where they're making them an offer or where they've made them an offer. Actually, they wouldn't do it before an offer, but they may call and just ask uh, if they can, if there's any information and so forth that they could get about the person and, or what they think of them. And sometimes they won't say anything directly, but yeah, they will often get backdoor references, but they're only going to get a backdoor reference if they have questions about you. So the, the best interviewers will be very good interviewers and they won't give people any question, any reason to ask questions and so forth about them. And they'll, the firm will be confident. So a lot of it's just your interviewing skills. How do you recommend marketing oneself on social media, especially LinkedIn and Instagram? I honestly, I wish I did know that there's so much to learn about that and so much I don't know, but LinkedIn and Instagram are, are two great ways that attorneys do market themselves. My my advice is just to, for both of those. And I am I do what I'm doing here and I I don't, I don't spend as much time doing that as I should, but I think you need to look at what other people are doing. I don't know that you need to hire people to do it, but you need to look at what other experts are doing and what other people in your industry are doing and then start, and then start copying and following that. That would be my uh, biggest piece of advice to see what are other experts doing and that's, and then watch what they're doing and, and the things that they do and then adapt your own style based on that. Okay, when a law firm says at the end of the screening interview, we're wrapping up first round and we've been in touch with X to us, but what can I do to read into that? That means that they're just, they're interviewing first people, you know, they're doing the first screening interviews and then they're gonna, they're gonna contact you uh, by the end of it. One of the things that I've noticed is when I like someone after a screening interview, I'll always say, I'll talk to you, talk to you later or something like that. And, and if I don't like someone, then I, I tend to say something more along those lines. So it doesn't mean that you didn't get the job. It depends on the person interviewing you, but typically when they, when they want, when they person, when they really like you, good sign. And then when they really like you, they'll say something at the end to try to give you an indication that they're going to be saying something positive to you in the future. That's not to alarm you, but that's how I am. And that's how I've noticed when a law firm, when there's any type of formality and so forth, many times it's not a good sign, but it depends on the organization, of course. Okay. So many great questions here, um, but we're almost done with them. Okay. Let's see here. You mentioned that relocating can benefit job seekers. If an attorney is barred in one state and does not do state federal work, how can she use relocation to find new opportunities elsewhere. You can, there's lots of states that you can wave into and it depends on your practice area. Most states you can relocate within the state. So if you're in a large market, you can relocate to a smaller market. I mean, relocating can benefit you. It depends on your practice area. So if you're in a practice area where there's not a lot of opportunities in your state, then certainly you can relocate. But relocating outside of your main market is always a good idea because if you're in a market with 50 firms that do what you do, then the odds are that there's probably another 25 plus firm or 25 plus markets in your state that may, you know, or 10 plus markets or five markets that do uh, something else. So the idea would be if you're in, let's just say, uh, let's use an example here. You're in California and, well, no, California is too big. Let's do, I don't know, Arizona. Even though it's big. But if you're in Arizona and there's 20 firms in your market to do what you do, there may be, the, there may be a total of 40 plus markets, same size or same or similar size, same 40 plus markets. I'm, I'm sure there are 40 plus markets in Arizona. If you take smaller towns and so forth, and that may give you a total of 300 firms. So that's, I mean, let's just even say 250 because a lot of them are going to be smaller. So that's just, if you relocate, you can do this kind of math anywhere. And then if you do this with, and then if you do it with 50 states or whatever, how many states, and some states will allow you to do bar reciprocity, some more states, Arizona is a really, you may have you know, 10,000 firms, so I, or maybe 15,000 firms. So I, I just, I don't, the idea that people don't relocate and think about relocating to me, and then they say, Oh, I'm having a hard time finding a job. It's just comical to me. I don't, I never have gotten it in the depths of every profession or the worst markets you can imagine so take 2000 when the internet crashed and 2001 and 2007 2008 anybody that would ever listen to this logic that i'm just putting forward it's so simple would always get plenty of jobs you can always get a job if you understand that and it's just some of the simplest the simplest way to, to think about the market and and getting a job and if you you'll always be fine but most people don't question this how should i phrase a thank you note to 
legal recruiting coordinator. I would just say thank you for arranging the interviews and really enjoyed. Thank you for helping with everything. And I enjoyed meeting. And then you list your three names of the people. And then you talk about something that each of the partners said in the interview that you liked. That's it. And it doesn't have to be over there. It just has to be uh, a nice message. And honestly, I, I haven't gotten a lot of thank you letters from notes from people in the past. And, and, and I think it's really nice when people send thank you notes. I really do like it. And, and I've written a lot about thank you notes over the past 20 years. And even honestly, 20 years ago, I think I wrote, or eight, 19 years ago, I wrote an article where I said, I didn't know if they were a good idea. And, but if they're done right, I think they can always be good. The only thing I don't like about thank you notes is a lot of times People do not proofread them and they make mistakes and that ends up hurting them. And, and so that's not good. Uh, so you need to proofread everything. You need to be careful. You need to be say less is more many times. And, that, and those are just some kind of general rules, but, and just be careful. How can I relax before interviews? I often get anxious and feel as conveyed in my interviews. I do very well when I can avoid this, but I'm not able to do so consistently. The best way to relax before interviews is there's a lot of different ways to relax and there's a lot of kind of visualization tools and stuff that you can use. One of the things that people have said to me before is to imagine that the people that you're talking to are like cartoon characters or stuff just to lighten you up. I don't know. I heard that one time and I thought it was pretty funny. And, and I think someone uh, even told me that once in an acting class. If you're anxious, that's always a good sign but you should use that anxiousness. Uh, that means you want to get the job. And that means that you're the kind of person they should be hiring. Someone who's very anxious is, is someone that should be hiring. If you're anxious, you should basically, you can even say, I'm a little bit nervous. I was, I'm excited about getting this job. That's actually can be en endearing and people will like, like hearing that. It makes them feel that you really want to be there and it makes people human and likable. I don't know that you need to quite relax too much. I would be careful in your interviews in terms of how you not being too nervous, but that that's the only thing I would recommend. I don't know if you have like massive anxiety or something there. There is something called beta blockers that people take for heart conditions. And it, and it's not, I don't think they're not like downers or anything. I don't know what they're called, but I've heard about people taking those to relax sometimes before interviews. I, I certainly have never recommended that. I don't know anything about them, but I'm just, I, this is the first time I've ever gotten that question. So I'm uh, just thinking out loud here. I think those are, and I, they're not it's some kind of heart condition or something. I don't know, but you can, I personally, to stay relaxed, I, I would, you can meditate, you can do other sorts of things, or you can exercise before you go on the interview and then maybe do visualization and so forth. But I don't know that you need to um, worry too much about that. Let's see here. What is the best way to sign up on a thank you note? Well, typically with your thank you notes, you just want to say a thank you and, and tell the person that you appreciate and just say thank you and, and then sign your name. I think that's about it. Okay, well, thank you for uh, being on the webinar today. And I do a webinar where you can, if you want, you can come tomorrow. It's for law firms. So we cover law firm questions. Tomorrow is going to be about something we talked about today is hiring people that really want to do the job. So there'll be a lot of insight into that. And you can certainly ask questions on that. It's the same time tomorrow. And, and the law firm webinar link, someone just asked that. So I will make sure that someone sends that out to everyone, but it should be, yeah, you should get that as well. I apologize. There should be a link to that up. And yeah, and yeah, and thank you for all the questions. I'll make sure that someone um, sends that out to everyone that was on the call. And, and thank you. And I will talk to everyone next week. Let's, uh, let's come here. Yeah.